subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. Join the only official Telegram channel of Rao's IA Study Circle to get relevant material and important updates. Hello everyone and welcome to the weekly edition of Daily News Simplified, where we take up the Sunday edition of the Hindu newspaper and explained section of the Indian Express for the last one week. The articles which have been taken up for today's discussion are listed on your screen. And the time stamping for these articles is already mentioned in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. This article was published on 18th of April in Indian Express Explained section and talks about the power boiled rice and why central government has stopped purchasing this rice form under the MSP. Now we have already covered the MSP in multiple articles previously in the DNS. So today we will focus more on what this kind of rice is all about, how it is produced across the country and why this rice is important for consumption in India. The context says that the central government has actually stopped the purchase of the excess parboiled rice of which Telangana is the major producer. Now center has argued that because the demand is low right now, center would not like to divert its scare funds towards buying the excess quantity of parboiled rice. Now, UPSC has asked the questions related to crops multiple times in the prelim examination. And that is also the purpose why we have taken this article from the perspective of prelims only. UPSC has already asked the question on cotton crop, they have asked question on jute and even they have asked questions on wheat and rice previously. So, important crops across the country and especially the crops which are mentioned in the geography book of NCRT are extremely important for each and every student in this examination. Now, what is parboiled rice? Well, parboiled rice simply means that this rice is partly cooked by the boiling process or mostly the steam process. This rice is partly boiled at the paddy stage even before the milling process starts. This is normally seen in the states which are situated in the southern part of India including Telangana, Tamil Nadu and even Kerala. The rice under this process is soaked in salt water for about 3 to 8 hours and they are dried up in the open air under the sun. This soaking of rice makes them a little bit more tender and easy to consume further. However, when the rice is soaked in salt water, they remain less aromatic and mostly they are utilized from the long grain perspective. So rice pieces which are normally consumed by the poor section of the society or the small grain rice which is consumed in the northern part of India is not part of this parboiled technique. Parboiled technique has highest production and stock from the states like Telangana followed by Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Some of the northern state also performs this duty of bringing power boil into the practice. However, when it is compared to the southern state, the northern state does not even hold 25% of the entire production. Now, why government or even these states are focusing on power boiled rice? It has certain benefits. The first one being that it makes rice more tougher. It reduces the chances of rice breakdown during the milling process, which also brings the efficiency during the milling process. It raises the nutrient value of the rice and it also provides higher resistance to the insect as well as the fungi which is being prone towards the rice crop. However, given the certain condition, it has limitations also. The first limitation is that the color of the rice becomes darker after the soaking process. The second is that it may smell unpleasant. As we have discussed previously that once this process is followed, the rice becomes less aromatic. And even the less aromatic rice is taken for this process. So, as the smell changes during this process, it brings unpleasant smell to the rice. And it also requires the higher degree of investment because it adds the extra stage of processing in the rice milling process. Now, 
government has been following a certain issues right now. The first one being that the total consumption has increased in the producing state. That is the top producer which includes Telangana, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So the domestic consumption of these states as far as parboiled is concerned has increased. The second one being that the destination state to which it was exported. Now what government used to do that under their different parameters and programs, they used to procure or buy these rice and sell it to the other part of the country. Now as the consumption of the source state has increased, simultaneously what we have seen that the destination states, that is the state which were targeted by the government for the consumption of these kind of rice has also seen a rise in their production. So one side the consumption has increased that has reduced the outsourcing by the government. On the other side the source state have also increased their production. So their demand has also been subdued. That is the reason why government as of now has decided to skip or to reduce the buyout of this kind of rice further. With this discussion in place, now I will leave you with this practice question. So read this question carefully and try to answer in the comment box. Let us now move to the next article for the day. This article was published on 19th of April in Indian Express Explain section and talks about how World Health Organization has seen the traditional medicine system in India. Now traditional medicine system simply means that medicines which are based on the traditional or age old belief system and this belief system is based on the physical study by the traditional writers and important scientists. Now India is known to have generated multiple medicine systems. We have yoga, we have Ayurveda and we also have systems like Siddha which proves that Indian tradition has been following the age-old medical system where different kind of techniques were utilized in order to bring healing to the ill human body. Government over the past 4-5 years has been seen to be working towards promoting the traditional medicines not only in India but also outside. So government has been seen through the nodal ministry that is the ministry of Ayush to promote as well as expand the infrastructure both physical as well as social infrastructure from the perspective of traditional medicine in India. Given the same trend, recently World Health Organization along with government of India has set up a global center for traditional medicine in Jamnagar, Gujarat. Now this is an international center that is going to cater the need of traditional medicines which are practiced across the world. There are many medicinal activities which are promoted across the world and India is also following 4-5 of them in its own system. So we have government dispensaries for homeopathy. Government is also looking to expand more such doctors and paramedics from the field of traditional medicine. Now traditional medicine and World Health Organization is important under the important national events from current affairs in the prelim examination. So what we will do, we will talk about the traditional medicines, we will talk about the global center for traditional medicine and its role and what World Health Organization has suggested towards the promotion of traditional medicine in India and outside it. Now as far as traditional medicines are concerned. It is based on the definition of World Health Organization itself and it says that traditional medicine means the sum total of knowledge, skills and practices of indigenous and different cultures. For instance, India's yoga is based on the culture of Vedic literature. Secondly, India's yoga is also India's indigenous technique of bringing relief to body's ailments. So it is the sum total of knowledge, skill and practices of indigenous and different cultures to maintain the health and prevent, also diagnose and treat the physical and mental illness of human being. Currently India is using many other techniques which includes Siddha, Homeopathy, Yunani, Sova Rikpa, Yoga and others. 
The first thing about traditional medicine is that these medicines do not have high degree and deeper research and development infrastructure. Secondly, the trust deficit which has been created over the past 100 years with respect to traditional medicines has not been bridged by now. Because of the allopathic treatment being very cheaper, faster and quicker as far as results are concerned, people have started following more of allopathy method over the traditional medicines. However, there are certain instances where allopathy is extremely expensive also. As per the World Health Organization, there are about 80% of the world population which are using the traditional medicines in one way or the other. And if you are thinking that this might be exaggerated, well, go through the important ingredients in the cosmetics used across the world. So medicine here does not only mean that a treatment is going to be there for a very serious illness. Even pimples or any small skin defect may be cured by the traditional medicines across the world. So neem is utilized in the face wash or even the benefits of haldi is utilized under different cosmetic products. That is the reason why 80% of the population has been observed utilizing the traditional medicine system in one way or the other. Now coming to the role of Global Center for Traditional Medicine. This is going to be there in Jamnagar, Gujarat and it has aimed to focus on the evidence-based research. This is extremely important thing. Evidence-based research will set up higher degree of confidence among the users of traditional medicines which is missing right now. It will also promote the innovation and data analysis as far as research is concerned. It will develop norms, standards and guidelines for technical areas. For instance, if India want to expand the Ayurveda or Yoga further to the international platform, then a set of norms, standards and quality check is important for these traditional medicines. And the center is going to fulfill all these demands. The center will also create the comprehensive, safe and high quality of health system across India and even outside it. It will implement World Health Organization's traditional medicine strategy, which was created through a decade system between 2014 to 23. This World Health Organization strategy clearly targets on bringing the promotion to the traditional medicines across the world. And as India is known to have one of the highest numbers of well-set system of traditional medicines, India become a core area or epic center for World Health Organization traditional medicine strategy. As you know, the nodal ministry for this program is the Ministry of Ayush where A-Y-U-S-H stands for Ayurveda, Yoga, Yunani, Siddha and Homeopathy. Recently, government has also included Soar Rikpa as one of the techniques for the traditional medicines. Now, let us go through the important challenges that have been faced in the traditional medicine system in India. The first one being the historical importance. There have been number of attempts which were created in order to integrate or to bring together all these techniques under one. However, we have failed by now in order to popularize these techniques under one ministry or under one instance. That is the reason why Ayush ministry as a separate entity was created in order to bring focus of the general public towards the traditional medicines. Then comes the inadequacy of the resources, right from medicines, lack of health centers, capacity building of the people, practitioners, public faith on their efficiency. As we have discussed previously, allopathy is highly popular for being quicker in terms of healing process. On the other hand, it is a popular perception that traditional medicines including homeopathy and Ayurveda takes their own time in order to bring the relief to the human body. And as we are growing in a society where slow pace is not considered to be good and everyone wants quick changes in their life. Following the allopathy becomes easier than following the Ayush sector. Then comes the issue of quantity versus quality. Now the question arises whether should we provide Ayush facilities everywhere or just focus on bringing the better results from the existing structures. That remains the issue to be answered. 
then comes that there is a high degree of competition from the allopathy. It has been observed that when it comes to the higher degree of results or very severe illness, for instance, the cancer treatment, people normally do not prefer to go through the Ayush way. They prefer allopathy. But when it comes to the small ailments like skin problem, maybe obesity or malnutrition, people might follow some of the tradition mentioned under the Ayush. Then comes the mindless cosmetization of the Ayush product. The private agencies and the private MNCs in the FMCG sector have been focusing on bringing more inputs from the Ayush, traditional knowledge of India, into their products. And seeing this, what government has observed is that the quality of these products have been focusing more on popularizing and commercializing an important ingredient rather than actually taking the benefits to the people. The last issue remains the conflict of interest between the allopathic lobby, that is the doctors, practitioners, hospitals and others with that of the Ayush. They have argued that the standard of medical care will be diluted once the Ayush become parallel to the allopathy in practice. Now, given these standard challenges, World Health Organization has supported and brought certain suggestions. The first one being that traditional medicine systems should be integrated. That is, still, India is not following all the possible traditional system it has. The second one, it should start focusing on conserving the biodiversity. And this could only be possible if we have good data system on traditional knowledge. Government should also utilize the existing technology to boost the traditional medicine system. For instance, artificial intelligence for diagnostic process, cloud computing for data storage, and even the MRI techniques for diagnosis of the human body and then utilizing their own medical system for better results. For instance, there might be an internal injury to a person. Then, certain scanning process which are used by the allopathic system can be used, human body can be scanned, important issues can be found out and then traditional medicines could be prescribed. WHO has also called for utilizing the social media to popularize such medicines and reduce the deficit of trust between the government as a service provider and the consumer as patients. And also, it talked about bringing more international cooperation for the promotion of traditional medicines in India. With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of Indian Express Explaining section appeared on 25th. 1st of April and talks about a recently launched submarine Vagshir, its features and capabilities. So we'll talk about her features first, then we will move towards the actual summary. The Vagshir is a diesel attack submarine which also functions on the motor basis, that is electric basis. Now government has utilized this submarine in order to bring C-303 anti-torpedoes as well as to ship it with Exocet anti-ship missile or 30 important mines in the place of torpedoes. The other features of this submarine include the advanced acoustic absorption technique that will reduce the sound. It will also have better hydrodynamic optimized shape and has the ability to launch the crippling attack on the enemies. Now, we have already covered this from the prelims perspective previously. So, today we will look into little bit more detail on this submarine and about the other programs as well. Now, Vagshir is a submarine which is an electric diesel submarine. Basically, it is functioning on the diesel motor. However, this diesel motor is also utilized to charge the batteries in order to keep the submarine for more longer duration time underwater. The biggest hurdle or the biggest disadvantage of electric diesel submarine is that it has to resurface for refueling time and again. On the other hand, nuclear submarines or nuke submarines does not require the frequent resurfacing for the recharge of the fuel. Now, nuclear submarines can go underwater for longer period of time vis-a-vis -vis the diesel electric submarines. Now, India since 1990s had decided to bring a 30-year long project to develop 
basic summaries now basic summaries here simply means the diesel electric summaries however with the advanced technology along for with this government P71 of india launched I. p75 project along with p75i both these project target to bring indigenous development of submarines in the field of diesel electric now vagshir would be the last or the sixth submarine which will be of the scorpion class submarine under this project vagshir is named after a sand fish that is found as a deep sea predator of indian ocean previously also india had the similar named submarine which india had borrowed or leased from russia in 1974 so there are two reasons to name the new or the sixth submarine as such as we have discussed it is a diesel electric submarine and the objective was to bring more or better surveillance system of indian naval forces in indian ocean because we all know that there is rising presence of china in the indian ocean vis a vis indian own naval forces and if india want to take the better hand india has to deploy more submarines in the indian ocean region especially in two important water bodies on either side of its peninsula that is arabian sea and bay of bengal now as we have said that this is going to be the sixth submarine the other five are ins calvary ins khanderi and ins karanch then we have ins vela and ins vigar and vagshir is going to be the sixth one apart from these india also have ins arihant which is a nuclear power submarine and top of all india is also going to have its own aircraft carrier with the name vikramaditya and vikrant however out of these two vikramaditya is the least one from russia vikrant is the indigenously developed with some parts being under the transfer of technology with this article in place now i will leave you with this question to practice so read this question carefully and try to answer in the comment box let us now move to the next article for the day this article appeared in today's the hindu newspaper on first page and this article talks about india's stand as far as india's grain exports are concerned with respect to world trade organization now let us discuss some background on this India is one of the largest producer of wheat and now India is also trying to become one of the largest exporter of wheat given the kind of vacuum created during the Russian Ukraine war now these two countries have been restricted as far as their international trade is concerned now the vacuum that has been created with limited supply of wheat has been captured by India However India is facing certain issues the first issue being that India is one of those country which enjoys a limited exemption under world trade organizations agreement on agriculture India requires to hold the overall food subsidy under 10% now India's minimum support price and the public distribution systems sometimes violate this 10% norm apart from this the second problem that india faces is that india's export of food grain is lower than the msp now most of the developing countries says and argue that india's msp regime is flawed and india's price to the wheat is not competitive in the international market now this difference of the international price with that of the msp in the domestic market has created hurdles for india in the world trade organization now the current situation is just reverse of what we have seen in the past now india has excess supply and india is ready to sell its output at any cost given the kind of demand being created in africa and west asia so india is looking to bring a temporary relief on world trade organizations rules where india can export given the international prices to these countries in order to fight the hunger now fighting hunger is a good argument but if things turn out to be in favor of india this will create more market for india's food export in the future and will create the trust between indian exporter and the consumers across the world market with respect to the food item now india has been known to violate the phytosanitary and sanitary norms of world trade organization 
Many European countries in the past have raised their issue with respect to the quality of food item being delivered by India. One instance was with respect to the mangoes being transported from India to Europe and US. So, as far as phytosanitary and sanitary measures are concerned, India is also looking towards more relaxation. The argument to bring hunger down requires India as well as World Trade Organization to stand together and sort out the issues under the agreement on agriculture along with other tariff and non-tariff measures for the time being. Now, we have covered this under different articles. So, today we will look into the prelim pointers on World Trade Organization. Now, World Trade Organization was created on 1st January 1995 after the culmination of Uruguay Round. Previously, this organization was known by the name General Agreement on Trade and Tariff. After the culmination of Uruguay Round, World Trade Organization became the international organization solemnly dedicated towards the free movement of goods and people across the border. It is the only organization and the top organization which deals with the rules of trade or terms of trade in the international market. It ensures the better flow of goods across the border as free as possible. That is the reason why it always endorses free trade agreement between the nations and support the multilateralism in international trade. World Trade Organization is not a specialized UN agency. However, it has certain cooperations and cooperative arrangements with the United Nations in order to bring the coordinated policy on international trade. It has over 160 members and covers 98% of world trade. As far as functions are concerned, it provides and operates as a global system of trade rules. So it has created numerous trade rules which the member country has to follow. They have also acted as a forum for the negotiation of trade agreement including the free trade agreement as well as the preferential trade agreements. They also settle the trade dispute between the countries when whenever they are raised in their dispute settlement body. World Trade Organization also support the needs of the developing country. And this is the reason why under Doha round, exemptions were provided to the developing countries for their better development vis-a-vis -vis the other rich nations of the West. World Trade Organization has also stood along with the developing countries in order to provide them the direct access or the market access to the developed countries with respect to their traditional products. As far as decision making is concerned, there are three important parts of World Trade Organization. The first one being the ministerial conference, the second one being the general council and the third one being the director general of World Trade Organization. As far as ministerial council is concerned, it is the highest decision making body and meets once in two years. All important rounds including the Doha round is taken up by the ministerial conference. The second body is the general council which takes day-to-day or the general administrative business of this organization. It is situated in the city of Geneva. The third one is the director general who is a single individual person who also acts as a single point of contact by nation in the World Trade Organization. Currently, this position is held by Gozi Okonzo Iwela. The other important points of World Trade Organization includes the most favored nation tag. It simply means that if one member of World Trade Organization is putting some benefits to the other, then same benefits should be forwarded to all other members of the World Trade Organization. Assume this, India is providing some tax benefits or benefits on the imports from let's say Nepal or from let's say Sri Lanka then India cannot discriminate on the similar parameters with other countries who are also the member of World Trade Organization. The second point of argument or the second point of issue remains under the World Trade Organization is with respect to dispute settlement body. It has been argued that dispute settlement body has remained partially towards the developed nation and has argued in favor of developed nations vis-a-vis -vis the developing countries including India. The third important issue with World Trade Organization is national treatment. National treatment means that whenever a foreign investor invests in the domestic market of a country, 
the government policy should not discriminate between the domestic investor and the foreigner investor. Let me give you an example. India is going through the e-commerce revolution right now. Now we have two important e-commerce giants. We have Amazon and we have Flipkart. Now Amazon is a international organization, MNC. On the other hand, Flipkart is India's own indigenous company. Now, World Trade Organization's national treatment says that India should make those policies which should not discriminate between Amazon and Flipkart. So, Amazon should be provided the national treatment which is being provided to the Flipkart itself. So, these were the important areas and we have taken this from the perspective of prelims. So, with this article in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article appeared on the 11th page of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper and talks about the shortage of coal in the present India's energy development. The country says that there has been a sudden decline in the coal stock in the country which has resulted in the outrage in some of the state and has also caused continuous power cuts across the states. This has not only impacted the residential locations but also the industrial one. Tamil Nadu has asked the Prime Minister to improve the situation of coal in the country. Maharashtra and Gujarat together have decided to import the coal from outside India directly. Now as the situation has arises, it is important for the student of UPSC to go through the important stages of coal and energy development in India. However, we have already covered that multiple times previously. So today what we will do, we will go up through the article and try to analyze it so that it can become more comprehensive. Now there has been a consistent fall in the coal stock across India. As per the article, more than 100 thermal power plants in India fell below the critical mark. That is 25% of their required stock. It simply means, let's say a power station requires 100 ton of coal. So as of now, their coal requirement is even less than 25 ton for the time being. And this is why it is known as the critical mark. While it was less than 10% in over 50 plants across India, 10% simply means that these plants cannot produce more than 15 days of power. And this is a critical situation. Now, the reason for this background is straightforward. The first one is the COVID disruption which was created previously. Under this situation, the power generation activity in the country was going through the mild development. Some of the power plants were either shut down or their extended capacity was not utilized. But as now the COVID situation is in the milder condition. So what we have seen that the power supply has not came back on the track as it was in the previous or the pre-COVID period. In the last two years, mining operations were low, industrial development was low, so the demand was itself on the lower side. However, a sudden jump in the economic development has extended the demand over and above the existing supply. Then comes the monsoon situation. The monsoon situation has created hurdles as far as coal mining is concerned. So it was not only the demand of power, but even the supply of coal has been hampered because of this uncertainty in the monsoon reason. And the third one was the increase in demand because of the ongoing summer season, which is going to be intensified in the next 50-60 days. So because of these three reasons, that is first and the third being from the demand side and the second one being from the supply side has created a sudden disbalance as far as demand and supply is concerned. However, it is not a matter of grave concern. The reason being the status of India's coal. India, as per energy outlook report, India's coal output or coal account about 55% of the total energy needs. And this is based on the ample supply of coal that India has. India is ranking at a fifth position in the world as far as coal reserves are concerned which is based on the 2016 report. So given the point second, the first point is valid. Higher availability of the coal has made India an over-reliant nation on coal power or thermal power generation. Now India is going through the transition phase. The first reason being that there is a higher coal power which is being produced. On the other end, India has to make 
and fulfill its commitments towards the clean energy. Now, this transition phase is going to be tougher for India. The reason being simple, the availability of the clean energy at a lower cost as of now is not possible. Secondly, the availability of coal and the infrastructure which is being available for the coal power or the thermal power in the country is abundant. Both these reasons has created a tougher transition phase for India towards moving away from the coal power plants. However, in the near future, India should try to bring down the share of coal in the overall production in order to reduce the uncertainty. While many economists and policymakers have argued that India should adopt the renewable energy. However, as per the article, there are a number of issues which might be faced with respect to the adoption of renewable energy. The first one being the variability of the resources. Right from the solar to the wind, there is a high degree of variability which is being particularly exposed during the period of peak demand. So we cannot increase the insulation of sun or we cannot increase the wind speed altogether when there is a sudden rise in the demand as we have seen recently. So in this case, we require some certainty, a regular supply of resources which could be assured any time. The second issue with the renewable energy is the diurnal variability between day and night. The third being the seasonal variation in India. So India is a country which goes through multiple seasons. So we have winters, we have summers, we have spring and others. And that is the reason why the speed of wind or even the inclination of sun rays differ from region to region. Then we have a similar reason of spatial variability. So places like Gujarat or places like Rajasthan are known for have better wind and sunlight. On the other hand, states like Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh are not known for better renewable energy. Land use remains the another issue where solar and wind power plant require large area and huge investment in one go. Threat to wildlife is also the another reason which is often seen during the wind power maze. And the last one being the transmission and the storage. As you might have observed, most of the solar and the wind power plant are located in the offshore or in the locations which are far away from the urban centers. This is one of the reasons why the transmission and the storage requires heavy investment. Not only that, even this transmission required elongated channels and medium of transferring energy from one area to the other area. And this makes the renewable energy less viable in the emergency situation. Now, what should be the ideal condition? Well, India definitely should move more towards the renewable energy, no doubt. But a certain percentage, maybe 20-25, should always be kept in order to meet the current kind of demand that is emergency demand. When the renewable energy cannot be put up under the pressure, coal energy or the energy produced using the nuclear power or gas power can be increased simultaneously and suddenly during the case of emergency. And this could be the long-term policy of India with respect to the power generation. With this discussion please now we come to the end of today's daily news simplify and i will leave you with question of the day